okay so in this lecture we will try to learn the quadrilateral quadrilateral uh, bilinear uh, elements okay so let us look at these elements and so let me draw the element first so okay so it doesn't have to look a perfect square a perfect rectangle it can have different shapes okay but it has to have four edges so it can be something like this also it doesn't matter okay it can be something like that also or this also it doesn't matter right and we will have our local coordinate system which is so we will have our local coordinate system so let me have something like this and this uh, axis is zeta I have been calling it epsilon but it is not epsilon and um, then I have eta which is a normal y axis when we talk about Cartesian coordinates so before going any further we will derive the shape functions and then we will come back to the other processes which will be required so we have done the shape function derivation in one dimensional uh, elements so for any node number k in one dimension we found out that it is equal to l k n if there are n number of nodes and we are targeting node number k then it is simply so it is simply x1 minus x x2 minus x and so on divided by x1 minus xk x2 minus xk and so on and you don't write for x so for kth value you don't write either the numerator or denominator but this is valid in one dimension the Lagrange's formulation and if we are targeting node number k in two dimension then we simply multiply this so we have L for zeta and L for eta for the whatever number of nodes we have well we should have same number of nodes so it doesn't have to be n1 and n2 but you know what it means <clears throat> so now let us look at so our node numbers are so this one is node number one this is node number two this is is node number 3 and this is node number 4 and in local coordinates so although we will have so node numbers 1 2 3 and 4 we have our global coordinates so at node number 1 we have x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y3 x4 y4 whatever is the value of these coordinates in when we are talking about zeta and eta in the local coordinate system we always have same coordinate for the four number of nodes irrespective of the shape of it okay it, it doesn't matter whatever is the shape wherever it is in the global coordinate plane so origin is here for the local coordinate system and the ends of the element is always having a value magnitude of that is one from the origin so this value so the coordinate here on node number one is minus one comma minus one this is one comma minus one this is one comma one and this is minus 1 sorry this is 1 comma minus 1 okay is it no 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 
So the y value is positive here. So eta value is positive and zeta is minus 1. And we have 1 here. Right? So here zeta is 1, eta is 1, zeta is 1, eta is minus 1. Zeta is minus 1, eta is minus 1. So these are the coordinates of the four nodes. Now let us look at the shape function for node number 1, n1. So for this we must calculate first the L for node number 1 for zeta. Okay, And the zeta is the horizontal axis. So we have only two nodes there. Right? So we can simply write it as so so the value here is epsilon of node number two right so that is epsilon of node number two so sorry not epsilon zeta of node number two because node number one we will not be writing because we are targeting at node number one so let me write it for that so zeta at node number two minus zeta and then there is nothing else okay divided by we will have uh, so we can write zeta 1 minus zeta k but that will be 0 so we don't have to write because we are targeting node number 1 and then zeta 2 minus zeta 1 so this is my so we are not writing uh, shape function we are writing l1 epsilon so this is our l1 epsilon let me further simplify it so zeta 2 is having a value of 1 it will always be 1 whatever is the coordinate system so the value is 1 minus zeta and zeta 2 minus zeta 1 is is having a value of 2 because this distance is 1 and this distance is 1 Right, so minus 1, minus minus 1, <clears throat> nah. zeta 2 is 1, zeta 2 is 1 and zeta 1 is minus 1, so minus minus 1 is equal to 2, so we will have 2 here, right, and this was the shape function when we had one dimensional element if you remember. Right, and this is exactly what we are doing because zeta axis is, is a horizontal axis and it is one dimension. This part is just this. And now L1 eta we have to find out. So for that we have to consider this direction. Right, and there we have to write eta 2 minus eta divided by eta 2 minus eta 1. So that will be, what is the value of eta 2? Eta 2 is having a value of 1. So 1 minus eta divided by and eta 2 minus eta 1 is 1 minus minus 1 is 2 again, right? So that is that and the shape function n1 is simply 1 minus zeta into 1 minus eta divided by 2 into 2 is equal to 1 by 4 into 1 minus zeta into 1 minus eta. So this is shape function for at node number 1. If you do the same thing for node number 2, if we do the same thing, okay, for node number 2, how do we do it? Can we can we decrease the size a little bit and let us do it here so node number 2 node number 2 we will have to write l1 epsilon so this part and we are targeting node number 2 now so we have to go backwards right we have to still consider this so there i have to write zeta 1 minus zeta and zeta 2 minus zeta I cannot write because that is the node I am targeting divided by zeta 1 minus zeta 2. But this I am doing it in reverse direction or am I? So if I look at this formula here I have to write 
x1 minus x, x2 minus x and so on. So I am writing epsilon, sorry, zeta1 minus zeta and then in the denominator I have to write zeta1 minus zeta2. So this should be correct. So this is this part and then I have to write this part L1 eta. So I have to write L2 eta. So L2 eta will be this, right? So L2 eta I have to write, then I have, then I must be writing so oh i made a mistake here here it is actually eta 4 eta 4 eta 4 minus eta 1 and you here you will get the same thing right because eta 4 is 1 we are going in this direction so this node number is 4 so we have two nodes in this direction only node number 1 and node number 4 and here we have node number 2 and node number 3 okay so we are looking at node number 2 and node number 3 the coordinates are 1 minus 1 no no 1 it is 1 1 and this one is uh, so eta is minus 1 this one is 1 minus 1 okay so we are calculating l1 for eta direction so we must write eta 3 minus eta divided by eta 3 minus eta 2 right this will be my shape function at node number 2 so epsilon 1 minus epsilon epsilon sorry not epsilon zeta this has this is embedded in my brain that's the symbol I always pronounce as eta so so have I have I written correctly? Yeah. So zeta one is minus one. Zeta one is minus one minus eps zeta divided by zeta one minus zeta two. So zeta one is minus one and zeta two is one. So minus one minus one is minus two into now eta 3 eta 3 is 1 minus eta divided by and then I have eta 3 minus eta 2 so 1 minus minus 1 is 1 plus 1 is 2 right so this becomes 1 plus zeta into 1 minus eta divided by this minus has been cancelled by taking minus common so we have 2 into 2 4 so this is 1 by 4 into 1 plus zeta into 1 minus eta okay you can we can also check it but let me also write the shape function for node number 3 and 4 and we will not do the same thing we know how to do it so I will simply write the values okay so let me write the values of shape function node number 1, node number 2, node number 3, node number 4. So this is what have we found 1 by 4, 1 minus zeta, 1 minus zeta. So 1 by 4, 1 minus 1 minus zeta into 1 minus eta. It always makes a circle and n2 is 1 by 4. 1 plus zeta into 1 minus eta then this n3 will be n3 will be 1 plus zeta into 1 plus eta and n4 will be 1 minus zeta into 1 plus eta I have not repeated anything yeah so these are the four shape functions and now look at our look at our uh, element again so this is minus 1 minus 1 this is 1 minus 1 this is 1 1 and this is minus 1 1 okay now let us look at node number 1. 
So zeta value is minus 1. So this becomes 1 minus minus 1 becomes 2. And eta has a value of minus 1. So this also becomes 2. So 2 into 2 divided by 4 becomes 1. So here the value of n1 is 1. Now what is the value of n1 here? So here zeta has a value of 1, right? So 1 minus 1 becomes 0. Then I don't have to take care of anything. It, the total thing becomes 0. Now let us look at shape function at node number 3. So 1 minus zeta, zeta has a value of 1. So this becomes 0 again. No need to bother. So n1 is equal to 0. Let us look at node number 4. Zeta has a value of minus 1. 1 minus minus 1 becomes 2, right? So this is finite. And 1 minus eta, eta is 1. So 1 minus 1 becomes 0. So then it is again 0. So you can you can simply uh, now check for other shape functions also that they will have a value of 1 at the node number where they are defined and accept that everywhere else they will be they will be having a value of 0 okay and if you look in this direction so you will see that for n1 and n n1 and n3 sorry n1 and n4 because this is node number 4 so you'll see that for n1 and n4 the first term will be same so n1 this part and this part is same because the zeta coordinate is same and for n2 and n3 this part is same because zeta coordinate is same right so the, these are the similarities which you can look at and you can simply write the value of shape functions all right so now we have the value of shape functions let us look at the generalized degree of freedom because this is two dimensional element in one dimensional element we only had one degree of freedom but because it is two dimensional element we have two degrees of freedom at each node so we have displacement in x direction and in y direction so we have displacement in x direction which you we may call u and in y direction we may call v and at each node we will have these values so here we will have u1 v1 u2 v2 u3 v3 and u4 v4 those will be the degrees of freedom the nodal values of degrees of freedom but generalized degree of freedom which is u can be written because it is a four noded quadrilateral we have to have four terms from the pascal's triangle so we can write u as a1 plus a2 x plus a3y plus a4 xy and v we can describe as a5 plus a6 x plus a7 y plus a8 xy okay so these are the generalized degrees of freedom and we can from our basic knowledge of solid mechanics from the previous course of mm302 where we learned of strain matrix we can simply calculate epsilon xx epsilon yy and epsilon xy so epsilon xx is simply del u by del x and the value of that is del u by del x will be simply a2 plus this will be 0 a4 y epsilon y y will be del v by del y so that will be this is 0 this is 0 a7 plus a8 into x and epsilon x y which is epsilon x y will be half del u by del y plus del v by del x and so that will be del u by del y this is 0 this is 0 a3 plus a4 x so, so this will be a3 plus a4 x right the first term it always makes a circle 
into not into plus plus now we have del v by del x so this will be 0 that will be 0 no no that will be a6 this will be 0 so a6 plus a8 y a6 plus a8 y divided by 2 and if we have to write gamma xy that will be simply 2 into epsilon xy which is equal to a3 plus a6 plus a4 x plus a8 y okay so we have the values of strain here which we can calculate simply from the our knowledge of strain matrix okay but this is not how the strains are cal i mean this is how its strains are calculated but not simply like this so now we have shape functions and we have generalized degrees of freedom now let us look at how do we proceed with our calculation so the values u and v which we have can be written as first of all first of all we know that this is an isoparametric calculation so generalized degrees of freedom can be written as shape functions and the coordinates also can be written as the function of shape functions so x i s and u i s are the nodal values of the degrees of freedom and x i s the nodal value of the coordinates so the coordinate at the nodes simply okay so because this is isoparametric so now let us look at the generalized degrees of freedom following this we can write the n matrix into the degrees of freedom how many degrees of freedom do we have we have eight degrees of freedom in this quad right so we have one two three four number of nodes and at each node we have two degrees of freedom so we have u2 and v2 and so on so we have u1 v1 u2 v2 u3 v3 u4 and v4 so we have eight degrees of freedom in one element okay how do we define the generalized degrees of freedom by writing the n matrix and the n matrix is simply written as n1 n1 and n2 n2 n3 n3 n4 n4 and rest of the things are 0 0 0 0 this into u1 v1 u2 v2 u3 v3 u4 v4 okay so you can check that this is correct how do you check it you can simply multiply so n1 into u1 n2 into u2 n3 into u3 n4 into u4 is u1 sorry u so u is because that's what we have written u is equal to ni ui so u is equal to n1 u1 plus n2 u2 plus n3 u3 plus n4 u4 and v is equal to n1 v1 plus n2 v2 plus n3 v3 and you know the last term right and this is what we get if we write like this in the matrix form okay <coughs> right and the now we will be formulating the b matrix and what is b matrix so we have to find out and b matrix we have seen before but in one dimension so what is b matrix so if we have to find out strain then a strain is simply del u half into del u by del x plus del v by del y right this is what we know and this is how we will find it out but how do you find out the differential of the generalized degrees of freedom you will have to differentiate these matrix somehow right and when we write this epsilon is equal to 
when we write this in the form of the nodal values of u and b and a matrix multiplied with u1, v1, u2, v2 and so on. So the nodal values. Then the matrix which is multiplied with this to get the strain values which is equal to that is called B matrix. right? <clears throat> what does it mean? It means that we have to find out the partial derivative of the the nodal degrees of freedom right so how will we do it so we simply can do it by finding out the partial derivatives of the shape function so basically we have to find out del del x and del del y of n matrix which is here right so instead of y because n sorry u is equal to n i u i. If I have to find out del u by del x, I can simply write it as del n by del x into u i. Because these are the nodal values. Okay. So the function, so the thing which makes it a function is the shape function. And instead, so if I have to find out the partial of it, partial derivative of u i, then I simply have to do the partial derivative of the shape function and I will get this. Okay, so this is how I can find out the strain value in finite element analysis, right? So I simply have to do the partial derivative of this matrix, right? Okay, so but there is a there is a there is a trick here. So. Uh, is it on? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we have to find out the partial derivative matrix. So epsilon is written as B matrix into the nodal values of degrees of freedom. So instead of writing U1, V1, I can say that it is Q, right? So Q, I have represented it. Although the better uh, letter for this will be D because well, D is displacement, Q doesn't sound like displacement. So I take your consent to replace Q with D. But in some of the literatures, you can find Q also written. But we will use D. So B matrix into the element nodal values of displacements and we can find out strain. So basically B matrix is the partial derivative of the shape function. So let us look how, what's, what uh, strains we have to find out. We have to find out epsilon xx, epsilon yy and gamma xy. Right? This is what we have to find out. This will be the left hand side which will be equal to the B matrix into the D matrix which is a column vector which is u1 v1, u2, v2, u3, v, oh, v3 and u4, v4. So this is 8 cross 1. This is 3 cross 1. What size of matrix do we need here? In order to have a correct multiplication, we should have, oh, we should have 3 cross 8 here, right? So three number of rows, eight number of columns we will be having in B matrix. Okay. So now let me write what will be the B matrix. So the B matrix will be, the first term will be del N1 divided by del X. Then second term is zero. Remember our, remember our N matrix also. Remember our n matrix also. So n matrix is actually 2 cross 8. Okay. And we are making 3 cross 8. Okay. So you will see why why we are doing it. You will see it. It is just that you know it is it, it might look complicated, but you know what we are doing. And because see here we wrote in this complicated matrix form, but it simply means this in equation form. 
right so there is nothing to bother about here we will see what do we mean by b matrix once we write it okay so this will be del n1 divided by del x second will be 0 and then here we have 0 and here we have del n1 divided by del y and then we have del n1 divided by del y and del n1 divided by del x okay now let us write for node number so our shape function 2 so n2 so we just we are going to repeat this thing uh, four times right so this has happened this we have done for shape function 1 we'll do the shape function 2 we'll do it for shape function 3 we'll do it for shape function 4 and then our matrix will be complete but now you know all you already know what the elements will be so let me just write it for you so it will be l del n2 del x 0 0 del n2 del y del n2 del y del n2 del x then del n3 same story n3 del y del n3 del y del n3 del x and del n4 del x del n4 del y del n4 del y del n4 del x 0 0 okay so this is what is our b matrix and and let me write the d vector here so u1 v1 u2 v2 u3 v3 u4 v4 okay and this complicated thing is very simple how let me shorten it just multiply this thing with this thing so every second term will be zero so v are out right so what is our first term what is our first term what is our first term is epsilon xx epsilon xx is equal to del n1 del x u1 plus del n2 del x u2 plus del n3 del x u3 plus del n4 del x u4 isn't it very simple because epsilon xx is simply del u x or del u is actually u x and u are same thing because u y is v so i don't need to write u x so del u by del x it is simply this but u is n i u i right so how do we find del u by del x we find it by doing this and this is what we have simply written i have expanded this and you get this and how do you get this by writing this matrix okay so i have expanded this and it looks bigger but it is actually simply this equation that's it okay now you multiply this with this what do you get you get epsilon y y oh epsilon y y what is epsilon y y let us look at here now so that is del v divided by del y right what is v v is n i v i so what will be del v divided by del y very simple right and this is what you will get because each uh, odd term will cancel out so u1 all u1s will be gone and you will have del n1 by del y into v1 del n2 by del y into v2 and so on so you will simply get this term and multiplied by that term so this is how we get epsilon y by why do we get two terms here why do we not have zero because you know how do we calculate gamma xy gamma xy is simply del u by del y plus del v by del x i don't have half here because gamma xy is 2 into epsilon xy right 
So we have del u by del y plus del v by del x and how do I how do I get it? I get it like this n i's into u I'm writing saying u and writing v u plus del del y of n i into v this is what we have to get and we will get it by multiplying this one this row with this column okay so in matrix form it looks very big but you know and how will you write this matrix now you know how will you write it okay so simply look at this equation and then expand it and then you can write the whole B matrix okay so now we have the B matrix and we have the shape functions we have the shape functions n1 is equal to 1 by 4 into 1 minus zeta into 1 minus eta this is our n1 right now I have to find del n by del x okay how do I find it I can write it del n by del epsilon into del sorry del zeta into del zeta by del x right and this is where our Jacobian will come okay this is where our Jacobian will come so so let us first find out del n by del epsilon and then we will look at how to find out del epsilon by del x okay so del n by del epsilon so how do we find out del n i's by del zeta i have said epsilon again so so but it should be zeta okay so now we have to find out let us say we have to find out del n 1 by del zeta what will be that value so we have to derivate this one with respect to zeta right so it will simply be 1 by 4 into 1 minus eta and then you do the derivation of 1 minus zeta which will be minus 1 so that will be minus so you can take minus in it will be eta minus 1 divided by 4 right and then you can have del n2 by del epsilon so that will be what is our n2 value n2 was 1 minus was it 1 minus or 1 plus I think it will be 1 plus where is our shape function where is our shape function? yeah 1 plus zeta into 1 minus eta so so n2 was 1 plus zeta into 1 minus eta divided by 4 so this will be 1 minus eta divided by 4 so should we actually have I done correctly let me multiply this so this will be 1 by 4 1 then minus eta minus zeta plus eta zeta sounds good and if you do the derivation with respect to zeta then the first term is 0 second term is 0 then minus 1 plus eta so eta minus 1 by 4 so this is what we get right so that is correct okay expand this so you get 1 minus eta plus zeta minus eta zeta divided by 4 so partial derivative of that will be with respect to zeta this is 0 this is 0 this is 1 this is minus eta so 1 minus eta divided by 4 and this is what you get okay so now we can formulate our partial derivative matrix right we can formulate our partial derivative matrix and from partial derivative matrix B matrix 
is del n by all the coordinates x i n i a weird combination of that I shouldn't write it in this index notation because well you know why because you cannot simply expand using tensorial notation and you get this but you know what B matrix is and we have to break this B matrix now in terms of local coordinate system and the partial derivative of local coordinate system with global coordinate system okay So, uh, where are we? Yeah. So, here we will need Jacobian matrix and Jacobian matrix can be. So, let me tell you once again. So, what are we trying to do? We are trying to find out the strain values. So, the strain matrix. Okay. So the strain matrix which is epsilon is equal to B matrix into uh, D vector which is a column vector and B is simply del n by del x and that's a matrix into D. And instead of del n by del x we have found out uh, we have found out del n by local coordinates or so del zeta and eta and all those things. So del n by del x can be written as del n by del zeta into del zeta by del zeta by del x. Okay. And Jacobian matrix is defined in a in a weird way so because the, the theory is related with the tensor uh, formulations so Jacobian in two dimension is simply the relation between the global coordinate and the local coordinate system <clears throat> so this is simply this del x by del eta into del y by del eta okay so if I have to write del n by del x then how can I write it using my Jacobian matrix okay how can I do it so what will I have to do is uh, my Jacobian is actually defining the partial derivative of the global coordinate with the local coordinate right and del n by del x will simply be then del n by del epsilon into j inverse because I need del epsilon by del x okay so the inverse of Jacobian will be required to calculate strain okay and this relation between x and epsilon can be find, found out by using isoparametric formulation because we know that the coordinates are related with the local coordinate system also in this form. So using this we can find out del x by del epsilon. Okay. So that we can do. And now we have the strain matrix and we have the B matrix. And using this B matrix we can calculate the stiffness matrix now okay so because we have to find out the forces we have to find out the force vector so we have to write this equation F is equal to stiffness matrix into the nodal values of the nodal values of the displacement okay so F we will have eight values here also so we will have well fx1 fy1 fx2 fy2 fx3 fy3 fx4 and fy4 so we will have this 
is equal to stiffness matrix into D which is U1 V1 U2 V2 and U4 V4 so obviously the stiffness matrix will be 8 cross 8 matrix right and this 8 cross 8 matrix can be written as in summation formulation I can write it as I is equal to 1 to n J is equal to 1 to n sorry n W i j into determinant of the Jacobian matrix i j transpose of the B matrix D matrix and B i j so B matrix Okay, no need to get uh, shocked here because there are a uh, little more information here but it, it is actually not that complicated. So what is B matrix that we know? Okay, so our B matrix is what is the dimension of our B matrix? Where is it? It's far away. Yeah. So this is 3 cross 8. So B transpose will be 8 cross 3. Right. And what is D? D, don't worry, D is actually elastic modulus uh, matrix. But it is a matrix which we have read in MM302. So, so that you will, that you know what it is. So we can write it in plain strain. We can write sigma 1. Sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, and sigma 2, 3. And if it is plain strain, then we will have sigma 2, 3, sigma 1, 3 also. Right? So we will have, no, we have 6 components. So, so we will have 2, 1 also. So this will be equal to a big matrix into epsilon 1 1 epsilon 2 2 epsilon 3 3 epsilon 2 3 epsilon 1 3 and epsilon 2 1 but this is in three dimension here we only have here we only have three values so we don't have this 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 we have this we don't have this sorry we have this we don't have this Okay, so we actually have sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and then sigma 2 1 equals the matrix into epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2 and epsilon or gamma 2 1. Okay, so, so here we have so this elasticity matrix when which we simply write it like this in FEM is known as D matrix. Okay, so we have stress matrix. There are some changes you see because it is different from the theory of elasticity because in elasticity we have nine components and even if we have to write for two dimensional element we will not write those terms. We will make it zero but we will still write three cross three matrix there because that is a tensor. But here in FEM, we convert it, it to a column vector. It is not a vector. It is a tensor. But we write it in a column matrix, the stresses and strain. Okay. So, so here we only have three elements and three elements and we have designed it in such a way so that it looks like a column matrix. Okay. So the D will be having three cross three elements. So we are actually decreasing the size, you see. If I have to write the whole thing in the form of sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 2 1 and sigma 1 2 and rest of the things are 0. If I have to write something like this, then I will have 81 components here out of which a lot of components will be 0 and then I will have strain matrix here if I, if I write it in the tensorial form. okay. So epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 2, 1, epsilon 1, 2, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 0. 
if I do it like this I will have to make I will have to use a lot of RAM because I will have too many zero element of course you can use a sparse element but this was done before uh, the sparse thing came so 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 that has been continued from since then so you don't have to go in that form you can simplify this in the form of uh, column matrix and so if I have three here three there then I need the elastic matrix to be of the order of three cross three right and this matrix is D matrix and in this case it will be simply so what will be my matrix so I will have sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 and sigma 2 1 equals e divided by 1 minus mu square and e is elastic modulus and that's a property that's not a component e is the elastic modulus mu is the Poisson's ratio and here I will have mu e1 and then I will have 0 and here I will have mu e1 e divided by 1 minus mu squared and here I will have 0 0 0 e divided by 2 into 1 plus mu so this will be my elastic matrix into epsilon 1 1 epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 2 1 okay and again it looks complicated but if you multiply you will get what you want so sigma 1 1 will be this into that right so this is e divided by 1 minus mu squared epsilon 1 1 plus mu into I have written e1 it should be just e so e into epsilon 2 2 and nothing else okay so if you remember our formulation of mm302 when we talked about a stress strain relationship and strain stress relationship then you remember our strain stress relationship was simply this so uh, 1 plus mu by e sigma ij plus mu into sigma kk delta ij right this was the relationship and you will get again stress versus strain relationship and you will guess you will get simply this okay so this is what we have written in the simple form so sigma 2 1 so if you if, if you look at the last component this into that what will you get you will get sigma 2 1 sigma 2 1 is equal to 0 that element 0 0 that element 0 so we only have last element which is e into epsilon 2 1 divided by epsilon 2 1 not epsilon 2 1 actually gamma 2 1 so gamma 2 1 divided by 2 into 1 plus mu and what is e divided by 2 into 1 plus mu you know it is simply g shear modulus so what I'm writing is actually tau 2 1 is equal to g into gamma 2 1 or in known notation if you know it is simply tau x y tau y x is equal to shear modulus into gamma x y and this is what we have written so it looks complicated but this is what it is anyway so this is my d matrix okay so this is my d matrix and and now what I have to do is I have to find out the stiffness matrix for the force displacement vector right so force is equal to stiffness matrix into D right and force is stress into area right is equal to K D and then you divide by the initial length and then you get so you divide it by L naught and then you get here the D matrix right the D matrix but the difference is we are not talking about engineering stress strain anymore we are talking about true stress strain so the K which is the stiffness matrix which is the relation between the force column matrix and the displacement column matrix can be given by this formula which we have written here where is that 
yeah so so here you see what is happening is that we have the e into strain and this is actually stress okay that is actually stress d into bij and determinant of j determinant of jacobian is actually one sixth of the volume of the element wij is the weighted residual so act so so okay so i have not told you yet so it is actually k is actually integration of bt db and that's it it is actually integration in the whole element and then we will talk about gauss quadrature in the next lecture but okay so forget about the stiffness matrix forget about this part okay forget about we will discuss this in the next lecture so in this lecture what did we what did we learn in this lecture we learned the derivation of derivation of shape functions for quad elements linear bilinear quad elements okay this is what we learned then we learned about the b matrix formulation b matrix formulation we also learned to find out strain matrix okay we learned to find out find out strain matrix which was simply b matrix into d matrix okay so this is what we learned we also learned what is d matrix for quad element okay for quad elements for two dimension it will be same even if it is a uh, bilinear quad or with linear shape function quadratic shape function it doesn't matter d matrix will be same so we learned all these and forget about stiffness matrix we will talk about stiffness matrix in the next lecture for this type of element okay so but this we have established we derived using lagrange's lagrange's formulation the shape function for the quad element we found out what b matrix is b matrix is del n by del x oh we also learned what jacobian is so jacobian but not completely so partially partially we learned what jacobian matrix is what d matrix is what epsilon what the strain is okay so so that was it and we conclude the lecture today we will learn about jacobian more and then we will learn about the stiffness matrix in our next class okay that's all for today thank you